This is our 24th week in the book of Acts. We'll be wrapping up <clears throat> in about three weeks. Uh, you will all here and in the venue as well be happy to know that I have fresh batteries this morning. Shouldn't be any awkward moments. <clears throat> if you don't know what that's about, you weren't here last week, you'll just have to go watch. The good news is this is the very beginning of last week's message, so you don't have to watch the whole boring message to uh, figure out what went wrong. <clears throat> Acts chapter 20. Hey, um, before, before we jump in here, let me, let me mention something that's kind of been on my heart this week. You've probably seen a lot, uh, whether you wanted to or not, heard a lot about the, uh, the mass shootings last week. You probably heard a lot of pundits give their whatever opinion on that. Can I just tell you <clears throat> that a couple of things are really clear to me um, about that, that issue in our nation. One is when you have an entire generation of young people, specifically young men who've grown up uh, in a culture and they, they pretty much their entire lives known that they live in a nation where somewhere between 1.2 and 1.3 million babies are murdered each year, why should them shooting up people be that big a deal? And, and the second thing I, I've thought about this week is the fact that studies ha have shown of the last uh, 27 mass murderers, people who have killed eight or more people, 26 of the last 27 are young men who grew up devoid of a father figure in their life. Okay, I don't care what the pundits say, I don't care what the politicians say, clearly, there's an issue in our culture of angry young men who've grown up in a culture where life has been greatly devalued. Why are we so surprised and why are we wringing our hands trying to figure out what needs to be done? What needs to be done is clear, and it's clear that the church needs to responsibly speak up and speak the truth and step into the gap, okay? <laughs> Acts chapter 20. <clears throat> We're going to jump in this morning in uh, chapter 20, verse 17. You remember the last week, Paul had uh, wrapped up his ministry in Ephesus, stopped by Troas from Troas. He has traveled while the others have gone on by ship. He's traveled by foot from Troas to Miletus. He bypassed Ephesus because he's in a hurry to get to Jerusalem. He has missed Passover. He wants to get there by Pentecost. But knowing it's the last time he's going to be in, in this part of the world, knowing that he'll not be back, he calls the Ephesian leaders to come and see him in Miletus before he leaves the region. Now, before we read the passage this morning, understand the heaviness of what Paul is, is saying here in this moment. He has spent three years with the Ephesians. Most of the Ephesians that have come to Christ, it's been because Paul has been there with them. He's been pouring the gospel into them. He's been pouring his life into them. He, he's their, their spiritual father. He birthed them. He raised them. Literally, as far as their spiritual life goes, Paul is all that they've ever known, and they are deeply connected to him. Have that in mind as we read Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse 17. Now, from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials happening to me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value or as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course in the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you on this day, I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own, with his own blood. 
I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to the grace of God. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands minister to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said it is more blessed to give than to receive. When he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all, and there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again, and they accompanied him to the ship. So this is a message to the leaders. Verse 17 says that they were the elders. Now, when you see the word elder or, or, or bishop or overseer or pastor in the New Testament, they're all synonymous. These men had been chosen to, to lead the church. Everywhere Paul went and planted a church, instruction was given to choose leaders. They'd been chosen to, to lead the church. Now, don't tune me out and don't think, well, if this message is to leaders, it doesn't apply to me because I'm not a pastor. Many of you in this room are leaders. You, you may not have the role of pastor, but you are shepherds, you are uh, teachers, you, you have people you're responsible to lead, you're, you're a deacon, or in some fashion, you serve in a leadership role. But even if you're here this morning and you say, well, I don't, I don't have a specific role as a leader, the encouragement and the exhortations that are given to these leaders certainly apply to, to all of us as believers, because the reality is, if you're a believer in Christ, Hopefully, people around you know that, and that means that you are an influencer. People look to you. People, if they know that you're a Christian, you're a follower of Christ, you're a disciple of Christ, they look to you to understand what that's all about. And the definition of, of leadership is influence. So all of us in this place, in one way or another, are influencers, and we have the opportunity to lead. Well, Paul starts in verse 19. He reminds them how he served wholeheartedly from day one. You see, he says that I served with humility. And, and the word serve there is to serve like a slave. Now, you may not remember this. It's been a couple of years back, but in our study of the book of James, we notice that there's a distinguished difference between a servant and a slave. Let me just remind you of some of the characteristics. A servant is typically paid. A servant can come and go. A servant can serve more than one master. A servant can change employers. A servant has certain rights and privileges. But a slave is property. A slave is wholly owned, not free to leave, can only serve one master, is totally subservient to the master's will, and operates in complete obedience and loyalty to the master. Paul was a slave of Christ. That's why he did what he did. That's why he went through what he went through. That's why he was willing to face the challenges that he faced, because he saw himself as wholly owned and completely subservient to Christ's will. He was a slave of Christ. Paul says, I served as a slave. I served with tears and trials. He reminds him of all the Jews specifically had put him through. Twice he had uh, difficulties with the Gentiles, but primarily his own people, the Jews. And he says, I continued to serve with these trials. I continued to serve with, with tears. It wasn't easy, but I wasn't going to give up. What you see in Paul is, is a consistent and exemplary life. His message was backed up by his conduct, backed up by his life. He served humbly and he served uh, faithfully. And anyone could look at his life. Anyone could inspect his life because he had nothing to hide. His life matched up to the message that he preached. Look in verses 20 and 21. His message was very clear. He, he didn't hold back. He took advantage of every opportunity. We know that every town he went to, he first went to the synagogue because that was a very public place. And in the synagogue, there were not only Jews, but also God-fearing Gentiles who were looking for something more. So he'd go to the synagogue. He'd go to the marketplace. He would go to public places. But he also went from house to house. Every individual person, every individual family was important to him. He wanted to be sure everyone knew of their need to turn from their sin, to repent, and turn to Christ and place their faith in the Lord Jesus. You notice this phrase, he says, I was declaring anything that was profitable. 
anything that was profitable. Paul's the one who wrote those words in 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is inspired by God. All Scripture is God-breathed. All Scripture is given by God. And he says, and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Paul's saying here, everything profitable I gave to you. You see, Paul and every true preacher and teacher of the word has to teach the full counsel of God. We, we don't get, get to pick and choose. If we're truly a, a pastor, a teacher called by God, we don't get to pick and choose what we want to teach. We don't get to pick and choose what we think will make people happy when they hear it and, and make them clap us on the back and say, oh, that was a great message. We don't get to pick and choose. We have to teach even what is unpopular in the culture. We have to teach even what, what makes people angry or, or, or frustrated when they hear it. Why? Because it's God's word, all of it. And that's what Paul was saying to these Ephesians. I didn't hold anything back. I taught you everything from the word, from the counsel of God. Verse 22, he shifts from the, the past, talking about his ministry, to the present. He tells them, the Spirit is sending me to Jerusalem. And he says, I don't really know what's going to happen there except this. He has told me in every city, the Spirit is constantly telling me that, that difficulty and trials await me. Now, you can imagine in these Ephesians who recognize this as Paul saying farewell, they've got to be asking the question, well, Paul, why would you go if the Spirit's warning you that trials and difficulties are coming? Why would you go? There's so much ministry here, so much effectiveness here. Why would you go? But he, he answers the why even before they ask it. Look in verse 24. He says, I'm going because I don't hold on to my life. Apart from Christ, Apart from my service to Christ, my life has no value to me. Remember, he's a slave. He is wholly owned by Christ. He is totally subservient to love his master, totally obedient. He says, apart from my service to him as his slave, my life has no value to me. He's the creator. I'm the created. He's the potter. I'm the clay. The clay has no right to declare to the potter what he will or won't do. He is at the disposal of the master, and he's saying the master can do with me as he wishes, difficulty, hardship, whatever comes, that's fine. Maybe Paul's remembering the words of Jesus in Mark 8 and verse 35, whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospels will find it. Paul was willing to lose his life. Why? Verse 24, he says, I want to finish the course. Paul used a lot of sports analogies. Perhaps he was a big sports fan before he, uh, he came to Christ, but one of his favorite analogies is that of a race. That's what he's talking about when he says, I want to I finish the course. I want to finish the race well. I thought about the course, and, and I thought about life some this week. I thought, you know, early on in, in life, as we start the race, we, we can't see the finish line. And so we kind of take our time, and, and we squander a little bit of time thinking we can make it up later. Maybe we get distracted and we, we get off course, but we assure ourselves there's going to be time and opportunity to, to correct course and to make up the lost time. Then we get to midlife. And perhaps a way off in the distance, we, we can see the, the goal line. And maybe there begins to be in us some small realization that we're not quite where we should be in the race. And maybe with that realization comes a little bit of pressure as we sense the clock seems to be moving more rapidly. But again, we convince ourselves there, there's still time. And then late in life, the goal is in plain sight. But we've expended so much time and energy without the goal in mind, we wonder if we're going to be able to finish well. Paul always kept the goal. He kept the finish line before him. He was always thinking about the course. The finish line for him was fulfilling the ministry that he received. And he refers to that in verse 24. What is that ministry? It's the same calling all believers have. The ministry is to testify to the good news of God's grace. That's not just the ministry of elders and pastors and, and bishops and overseers. It's the ministry of every believer to testify to the grace, the good news of God's grace. Well, then Paul tells him in verse 25, I'm, I'm not going to see you again. And in verse 26 and 27, and this is probably the key point for today, he makes, a, he makes a summary statement about his ministry among them. 
And in that same summary, he he declares the seriousness of the responsibility that they had and and that we have in declaring the gospel message. I want you to look at it. You maybe want to underline it in, in your Bible in verse 26. Look what he says. I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink back from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Paul seems to be drawing from Ezekiel chapter 33, the analogy of the watchman. In, in the city, a watchman was placed on the wall or perhaps on each corner of the city. Watchmen were placed to watch for danger, watch for enemies approaching. And the watchman's task was very simple. All he had to do was sound the alarm. He wasn't necessarily involved in the defense of the city. He simply had to sound the alarm. If he saw danger coming, he would sound the alarm. And the watchman fulfilled his task when he blew the warning trumpet in the face of danger. That's it. That was his whole responsibility. You see an approaching enemy, you blow the trumpet, you sound the warning. But if the watchman fell asleep at the post or the watchman got distracted, if he failed to warn, the blood of those who were killed was on his head. He bore the responsibility for that. Now, once the watchman sounded the warning, he was no longer responsible for the lives of those he was supposed to warn. He was simply to sound the warning, and then the responsibility to act was on them. Well, Paul says, look, I have preached the full gospel, the whole will of God. I have called people to repentance. I I have warned people. And, And this remark, understand, is not just Paul defending himself in his ministry. The Ephesians loved him. He didn't have to defend himself to them. He's not just defending himself. He's giving an example to the Ephesian leaders and to us. They were to do what Paul had done before them. They were to herald the gospel and call people to repentance. They were to sound out the warning. But listen, this is not just the task of someone like Paul or the leaders of the Ephesian church. It's the task of every believer. We all have the responsibility to sound out the warning. We all have the responsibility to proclaim the gospel, and we're going to be held accountable. Now listen, this is one of those areas when when you're declaring the full counsel of God that people get kind of ruffled and kind of upset. What, What are you saying, that the blood of people is on my head or on my hands? I'm not trying to make you guilty. You don't serve the Lord out of guilt. But I am trying to, to, to warn you, to encourage you that God's given you a commission and God has given you responsibility. If you know Christ, your responsibility is to share that and he is going to hold you accountable. In my study, <clears throat> I have a, several papers taped on the shelf right above my computer monitor where I see it often. The big sheet It's from a couple of years ago where I got word about a young man who was a terminal, who was in the hospital, angry, bitter toward the Lord, not not somebody you'd typically want to go share with. Attached to that is a little post-it note where one of our staff ladies told me that he had gone home from the hospital with hostess care, and I thought, well, okay, I'll, I'll go by and see him. I didn't. As far as I know, he went into eternity apart from Christ. A few months after that, I put this little note on there. It was a uh, name of a man that I heard about who his friend wasn't sure that he knew Christ. His friend had been talking to him and said, I think he just needs to hear from someone else. And I made several contacts. I never did yet to go see the man face to face, but we talked by phone never to get to share the gospel message with him, but I made several attempts to do that. The next sheet on here is a man that uh, I knew, a, a business acquaintance. I heard that he had terminal cancer. wasn't near the end, but uh, immediately I got one of our deacons, Casey Kraft. Casey's right over here. And within a day after hearing about that, Casey and I went to see that man. We shared the gospel with him. He looks fine. Had no idea he was that close to the end. That was on a Wednesday. Friday he died. Apart from Christ, never received the gospel. But you know what? While I'm saddened that this man went into eternity apart from Christ, 
I rejoiced over the fact that I'd learned a hard lesson. And while that man had family around him who knew the Lord, that man probably had other people to hear from. When the Holy Spirit revealed to me that this man was going to die, I was not about to miss the opportunity to share the gospel with him. And I could, like Paul said to these Ephesians, I can say in the case of that man, his blood is not on my head. My responsibility and your responsibility is simply to proclaim the gospel. We're called to be witnesses. All a witness can do is speak the truth. The responsibility is, is the hearer's responsibility. God doesn't hold us accountable for whether or not they received the message, only for whether or not we delivered it. That's a hard word. You may not like the fact of, of walking out of here saying, well, you mean I've got the blood of all these people on my head? Listen, God's going to hold all of us accountable. Christians are not free from accountability. You will one day stand before Christ, even though you are going to heaven if you know Christ, you will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And, and if you had to sum up what he might ask you, you can probably sum it up in, in one question. What did you do? God's going to ask you, what did you do with my son? Now, if you received him, clearly you have eternal life, but he still wants to know, what did you do with my son? If you received my son and you had eternal life, what did you do with him? Did you share him? Did you warn? Were you a watchman on the wall warning those around you? Well, beginning of verse 28, there's some very direct words to the leaders he tells them, pay attention to yourself. You, you can't lead where you're not going. You can't lead if you let sin uh, derail you and destroy you. And, and there's several specific things he says. In verse 33, he tells them not to be greedy. As a leader, specifically as a pastor or shepherd, you, you're not to look to gain or to prosper from your role as shepherd. As a shepherd, as a pastor, um, to be paid, sure. He's worthy of the work he does, but he should not gain or, or prosper in a big way financially from that. Don't be lazy. Paul reminds them, look, when I was among you, I worked hard to provide not only for myself, but those who were with me, those who were part of my team. You need to work hard. Don't, don't be selfish. Down in verse 35, you're, you're to be a giver, not just one who receives. He's not just talking about money. He's talking about their very lives. Paul literally gave his life. He understood Jesus' words in Mark 10, 45. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many, and that's how we're to live. So he tells them to watch themselves, and then he says, watch the flock. The, the body of Christ is seen as a flock. The shepherd is to feed them and, and to care for them and to watch over them. And, and he gives them this reminder, this strong charge when he says, watch the flock. He says, remember, this is God's church. He shed his blood for it. Listen, as the pastor of Geyer Springs, I daily remind myself and I say before the Lord, God, this is your church. It's not my church. I don't have the right to take it where I want to go. I can only hear what your plan and your purposes are and lead the church the way you tell me to lead. It's his church. And then he warns them, false teachers will come. They'll bring great harm on the flock. They're going to lead sheep astray out of the safety of the flock, and predators will destroy them. We, we talked a couple of weeks ago about false teachers, that we have to be on our guard. But, but look, he says, even within the body, there are some who will twist the truth to gain attention and prominence for themselves. And then finally, he tells them, you need to be willing to admonish. You see that down in verse 31. Listen, the word admonish means to instruct with a stern warning. You're going to someone, and you're, it, it's what Paul said in 2 Timothy 3.16, the, the, the Scripture is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction. You're going to someone, and you're instructing them in what the Word of the Lord says, and you're giving them a strong warning because they're off course or they're, they're off the path. And I want to tell you that pastors, shepherds, don't enjoy having to do that, but it's their God-given role. Then you see after the final instructions, they knelt. Why did they kneel? Because they're acknowledging their dependence on the Lord. They prayed. They said their goodbyes. Now, looking back, 
That's, that's quite a heavy load you see that, that's placed on these leaders, and maybe that gives you some idea of how to pray for the pastors and leaders in your life. But understand me again, be very clear, this is also some clear words for every believer and every disciple. Why? Because we're all influencers. And whether we recognize it or not, we are leading someone. And so the question this morning is, how are you leading You remember Paul said, look, here's my life. You can examine my life and you can lay it against the message. There's integrity here. How am I leading? How are you leading? Not not just with our words, but with our lives. And then how, how am I doing and how are you doing as a watchman? Are we sending out the warning to those that are around us in our neighborhood, in our school, in our place of work, the marketplace where we go and buy, and how are we doing it? Sending out the warning. Paul was able to say, I'm completely innocent because to the best of the ability God has given me, I have spoken the word of truth, complete truth, to everyone I encountered.